You know what? You, come, come up here for a second. This is Chris Martinez, and odds are you have no clue who he is. He's not a famous YouTuber, and in fact, he's hardly ever been in front of a camera. Yet at this moment, he finds himself on live TV, face to face with his idol. Hey, that's Kevin Smith, Silent Bob, from all those terrible Jane Silent Bob type pictures, man. Check out Chris's reel. It is far more visually interesting than any movie I remember. Chris was just four years old the first time he met one of his heroes. Things did not go as smoothly then. His interest in how his heroes were brought to life never stopped growing, eventually finding himself inside the octagon with UFC champions. Me and my friend uh, Chris uh, Martinez, we uh, produce it, uh, we direct it, we do it ourselves. He does all the editing. It was just like, wow, this guy does really good work. I pulled him aside and he's like, you got a knack for this. I go, let me hire you. I hired him, me and him, we busted stuff out. But I've been watching uh, a couple of episodes of your show and it's Tito Ortiz Uncaged. Correct. And great production value. Looks like you guys are really spending some money to do these things because they look phenomenal. I have a really good editor, you know, Chris Martinez. But the lighting is, everything about it is really nice. Yeah, thank you very much. It's just, uh, I think when you have someone who puts their heart and soul into something um, that I love and he has my back the same way, I think you get a good product. And it shows. I mean, I look at it and I'm just like, wow, this is getting better and better and better. And how do you reinvent yourself each and every time to make it better? And Chris Martinez is doing that. And I'm very thankful. And um, I just, uh, I think I got something pretty good that is going to keep working. I dig it. I couldn't have said it any better myself. I'm talking with Chris, and we just got finished talking about the Tito Ortiz on case. And I'm like, man. What possessed you to think of something like this? And production value is very high. Congratulations on the badass, good looking show with cool content. Yeah, just tell us who you are from start. My name is Marlon Berra. Everybody knows me as Cheetah, and I came from Ecuador. Well, for this fight, I, I decided to have a, a camera crew with me. Uh, I partnered up with Chris Martinez, and we, we want to start making series of, of my life, of my training, or of my upcoming fights. I don't give two f who you are. I'm going to punch in the face. I'm gonna try to hurt you with any thing. But if you say something on social media, that's good, promote the fight. But for me, it's business. I'm gonna go in there, fight, and you know, do anything I can do to win the fight. Make sure you hit like and subscribe. On stage with Grammy winning icons. Hey, what's up, what up? Power 10? Yeah, 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 shout out to Power 10, it's Neighborhood Net. Power 10, the hoods and the suburbs, man. You know how we get on top. Come on, you dig that? Come on here. Team does great music. We've been doing from the jump for years, you know. And down the red carpet with legends of Hollywood. I have to watch UFC. Joining the UFC. UFC, you have seen the fighting? Or? No. No. Hi, I'm no. Sorry. I'm sorry. Look, look, look at me. Wonderful. Pick some ass. You're gonna kill it. <laughs> what are you? Are you two? Are you two? We'll see you guys soon, all right? All yeah. right, take care. Hit that subscribe button too. We love you. Subscribe again. Get it. Subscribe again. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you watch UFC? Yeah, watch yeah. UFC. Go out there and handle your business. <laughs> Good luck. Keep punching. This is Chris Martinez. You know his story well. Perhaps next time he can help tell yours. And that's the bottom line, because we said so. Jeremy. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. Wow, that's a, that was a great intro. <laughs> where did it all start? You know, where are you from? What was your childhood like? And how did you uh, eventually become the toy man? So first off, uh, awesome to be here. And uh, yeah, I, I started uh, in toys in 1989 when I was in high school. Um, I, I was working for a, a place called Only Kids in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was a toy store and it was also a clothing store. So I uh, dressed kids up, I hemmed their clothes, and then I took them to the toy aisle and figured out whether they might want to buy any toys. And uh, when I finished high school, uh, I went to college and I went to graduate school. And during graduate school, my first year of grad school was law school. And I sucked at it. I was awful. I was like terrible. And I was like, you know what? I got to figure out a way to pay for this. So I started creating a series of websites uh, after watching a TV show one night where this lady was like, I'm making money selling advertising on the web. And I was like, I could do that. Why not? It was like 1996. It was Wild West. And uh, I, I taught myself a little uh, source code and I created some websites where you basically, where I gamed Yahoo. And on Yahoo, it was just an alphabetical search engine, A through Z. 
in any particular category. And uh, so on Yahoo, what I did was I simply um, named everything with two A's, absolute Beanie Babies, absolute Furby, absolute this, absolute that. And I showed up first in, uh, in, in each categorical web search. And because I was showing up first, I was uh, crushing it. I had like 20,000 people a day coming through my series of websites. It was pretty awesome. Um, after, after that, I got uh, uh, recruited uh, to Mattel after business school. I'd, I'd gone from law school to business school, graduated both, spent five years in grad school after undergrad, and, uh, and got recruited to Mattel. And that's where it really kicked off 20 years ago. So as a kid, you played with uh, toys, I assume. What, what was your favorite toy? What, what was your childhood uh, toy upbringing like? So my three favorite toys as a kid uh, were Hot Wheels. I would line them all up, and I would race them across the carpet. Um, I would spend something like three seconds on each car kind of moving it, and I would have the whole line, and I wouldn't even know who would win. But by the time I would get to the end of the carpet, maybe an hour and a half later, one of the cars would be the victor. And uh, it would be pretty awesome. I'd be excited about that. Uh, I also loved LJN wrestling toys, uh, 1983, although I was 10 years old at the time. Uh, it was perfect for me, and I wasn't embarrassed at all that I collected those action figures because I loved wrestling so much. Um, but before I had the LJN toys, I was using, um, using G.I. Joes as my uh, wrestling figures, and I was naming each G.I. Joe a wrestling name and giving them a win-loss record. So those were my three big ones. Uh, interestingly enough, that uh, the guy who created LJN, Jack Friedman, uh, ended up being my boss at, at, uh, at Jack Specific when I went there in 2002 uh, to head up the boys' business and specifically the WWE. So that was interesting. Th those were some really great conversations between you know, a guy who my favorite toys, made my favorite toys, and, and myself as a, as a young employee. I would assume that you think there's something special in that, that it wasn't just blind luck. It wasn't just, you know, you stumbled into this job, you know, and I know everybody loves toys, but, you know, do you think there was something special in, in your journey? And how, do, how would you explain it? I would say that uh, it's amazing how opportunities come to you when you are enthusiastic and passionate and, uh, and when you have an ability to communicate. Um, so for me, once I was at Mattel, um, it was, it was lucky that in the same city where I was working was the company that had the WWE license, but it wasn't an accident that I took that job, uh, because if they'd offered 20 different jobs to me, I might've said no. If they offered this one, how do you not say yes? Especially when you love WWE and they're giving you the opportunity to head up the entire group and you're 29. So for me, it was like, you know what? I have to say yes. There's no other way about this. I'm saying yes, and I'm going to do it. And it turned out to be one of the best career decisions I've ever made. Again, following passions. And, uh, and when I got there, after working at Mattel on things like Nickelodeon and Hot Wheels and Masters of the Universe and some of the Fox brands, um, when I got to Jax, I assessed the situation and I looked at the WWE business and I thought, you know what? It was just after the Attitude Era. And I was like, you know, this is being treated like a toy brand. And what it is, is it's a collectible. We need to treat this like a collectible. We treat this like a collectible. I think that even though, you know, the ratings are down, we can still do some great business. And over the course of the next seven years, we grew that business about 700%. Uh, from one of the brands being pulled off the shelf to the number one boys action brand uh, in the world for a while. It's a pretty amazing run. Well, I mean, I know you can't share the, you know, the secret recipe, but what was kind of the mindset that you approached that challenge of taking on something like WWE? I mean, for me, the, the key was understanding that as a collector brand, what do you need to accomplish? And what you need to accomplish in a collector brand is you need to engage older consumers. And the way I did that is I, I looked and assessed the business and I thought, well, how many times can we do Stone Cold Steve Austin? How many times can we do John Cena? How many times can we do The Rock over and over and over again when they've been done 75 times since 1999? This was 2002. So I reached out and I had the opportunity to sit with Vince McMahon and I gave him my plan. I said, my plan is to leverage the strength of your uh, alumni. 
your your superstars, your classic superstars roster. So I collect, I correct, I ah, I invented classic superstars. And essentially, the idea was uh, Vince was a little reluctant because the, his perspective was, well, if we create um, uh, an alumni group and you've already got their wrestling figures, how can we do that? And basically what I said was, we'll set up a contract where the moment you get the deal, we lose the rights as a company to the toy deal, but then we gain the rights to your toy deal on your bigger contract with the, with the superstar. And he's like, uh, that could work. That could work. So he greenlit it, and, uh, and we went with it. And we signed, I think, a couple hundred classic superstars. We made hundreds of classic superstars. And it really was a massive catalyst, not only in that business, but I think it really changed the way people looked at action figures uh, because it was considered a kid's brand, and then we repositioned it as a collector brand, and it just changed everything. Vince is a, a larger-than-life character. I'm sure you've worked around other personalities that are huge and could possibly be intimidating you know where does the confidence in you come from to uh be bold in your ideas and fearless and and really uh you know lay it all on the line well i think i think you'd be surprised to find out that a lot of times people who manage brands aren't necessarily passionate or enthusiastic about the brands they're managing they're, they're doing a job and they happen to get repositioned into that job. And especially 20 years ago, when collectors were not necessarily considered the primary uh, intended recipient of any purchase, you know, collectors were kind of like the second thought, kids were first. And so it just so happened to be that I had the passion and the knowledge. And in that particular brand, I've managed a lot of brands, I don't feel as passionately about every single one of them. You know, it was not hard for me. Uh, to feel a very particular passion and really know the underlying character base so well. And so that, that's what really drove it. And so sitting down with somebody and having a discussion uh, when they can't really find fault with you because you like the product so much and you're well thought out, it really helped my case. So what are you up to these days and the properties that you have your hands in most? Uh, could you share some of that with us? Yeah, so after I left Jack's, um, we, uh, I, I joined in with a startup called Wicked Cool Toys and at Wicked Cool Toys, we were a, a zero dollar startup. And in seven years, we went from that to one of the, you know, larger, most known toy companies in, in, in many circles. I mean, really one of the top 20 toy companies. And, um, we had Pokemon globally and Cabbage Patch Kids, and we brought in Microsoft's Halo and, Micro Machines and uh, AEW and a few other major brands, Coco Melon. And then in October of last year, we were acquired by uh, Allegheny Capital Corporation, which is a big private equity group. And they paired us with Jazzwares. And together, we are Jazzwares. And Jazzwares is one of the top 10 toy companies in the world. Um, and now we have Roblox and Fortnite and uh, Peppa Pig and... Uh, all of these other major brands, uh, along with the brands that we had at Wicked Cool Toys, uh, under the Jazzwares banner. And um, really one of the most uh, meaningful toy companies out there and growing very quickly because we tend to hire people who, who are extremely passionate about the brands that they work So with. I kind of envision you having like a, a master plan board with, you know, all these different characters from our childhood and, and you're just kind of going one by one in your career and knocking them out. Well, it just depends on the category. Like if you're going after a girl's property, there are certain elements that you look for. Um, maybe it's nurturing. Maybe it's uh, a theme that you're looking for princess or, or, or maybe it's fashion oriented. Um, if you're going after a, a collectible property, Often it's about the the breadth of line, the breadth of characters, or collectability, or uh, or superhero or anime. Um, if you're going after preschool, um, you know that's a whole other set of of play patterns. Uh, it just depends on the category that you're going after. And for me, having done this for so long, I have a pretty good handle on each category and the needs of the kids. Uh, boys and girls within the category in terms of what you know really makes them excited to play. But at the very, very basis of it all is simplicity. Uh, because if you overcomplicate anything, um, it no longer is really viable as in toys. 
another great brand that uh, you're spearheading is the UFC. I'm a huge fan. Um, talk to me a little bit about that line. So originally in, in 2009, um, before UFC had ever had a toy, um, I reached out to uh, UFC and had dinners with Dana White and, and really assessed the line and the opportunity then. It was interesting because it was before they had had a really uh, uh, consumer products program. So a lot of the athletes were independently signed to other organizations. There was one company called Round Five that was individually signing these guys up and doing stylized figures. And so signing the license would have meant nothing unless you had the fighters. So I went to Round Five and negotiated a deal where we would trade the rights to the UFC brand for their Round Five figures uh, to be able to make the characters. Um, uh, in the other uh, UFC categories. And they said, yes, thankfully. And we worked that whole thing out and had a, you know, a nice couple year run in UFC action figures. Uh, well, coming to Jazzwares, one of the benefits after selling the company and joining forces is that they had already signed UFC. So it was kind of cool to come back together with the UFC. And now we're developing product. Um, we're going to be developing a product that's in scale with our AEW figures and the WWE figures that are in the marketplace now. We put out a beta test figure that's a little bit smaller, um, but my mentality uh, coming in was, hey, we need to have all these figures be in the same scale. So we're, we're, we're going down that path now. So where do you see the future of toys and properties and uh, what does the future hold for you? Well, I mean, I think, I think the future is, is wide open because the content is coming from everywhere. Uh, you know, viable content can come from uh, social media, it can come from Twitch, it can come from TikTok, it can come from YouTube, it can come from Netflix, it can come from network. Um, and I think that we really are at the point now where um, I think we're coming to, I think we've come to the point now where it's probably more wide open than ever, uh, which I love because when things are super, uh, uh, when things are not fragmented, when things are super consolidated, it tends to play to only the largest uh, entities. But when things are fragmented, it really is best for those who know how to find the next big thing. And that's, that's what I feel like uh, I tend to do really, really well. So the future for me is continuing to look for the next big thing. It's continuing to, you know, to really drive this thing. And, uh, and, that's, and that's how I see it. Uh, another big side of what you do I've seen on your social media is you're a collector yourself, right? And you do oh, a yeah. collectibles for huge profits, right? And you, I think you want to teach people how to do stuff like this, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, uh, earlier this year, uh, I had a big six figure transaction on Pokemon. I set the record for the largest purchase of a first edition Pokemon set at the time. It was like 130 thousand dollars then things have skyrocketed skyrocketed so you know if you want to touch that pokemon set today it's probably closer to three hundred thousand. um but yeah no i love teaching the fundamentals of collecting and so absolutely i mean from a business perspective absolutely follow me through jazzwares but if you're looking to learn about collecting on a on a more gorilla level reach out to me on instagram at Jeremy Pudauer, and I, I always love teaching people and communicating fun ways to collect and, and use that as, a, as an investment. You're turning the toys over for huge money now, but I'm sure along the way there were some uh, tough spots. Uh, what kept you going throughout your journey when maybe things weren't looking so great? Desperation. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think honestly, the truth is that if you believe in something and you love something, um, that it, it doesn't, it's not a struggle to chase it in the hardest times. And, um, it tends to be a struggle when you, uh, when you don't, you know? And so that, that for me has been very important. Awesome. Well, Jeremy, I won't take up more of your time. It's been a pleasure having you. Uh, last words for our uh, audience, where could they follow you and uh, what could they expect from watching you on social media? I mean, you can follow me at Jeremy Pedauer on Instagram or at JeremyCom on Twitter, uh, but also follow Jazzwares at Jazzwares on all social media sites. And, you know, my objective is to uh, 
you know, please collectors and make them excited and teach them as well if given the opportunity. So uh, great, great to see you today and always excited to connect with people. Talking to you, when I was a kid, uh, this was my hero, Power Rangers, and I would watch him every day on TV and play with my uh, action figures. But I'm going to make sure my son has a, a Conor McGregor and a Max Holloway and uh, the whole UFC line. Uh, and maybe some AEW guys, too, because they're pretty cool. Sammy Guevara <laughs> is my guy, so shout out to Sammy. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. Virtual pound. Let's go. Thank you very much.